Right in the model of perfect competition, we saw that when you have so many buyers and sellers in a market that any economic profit is competed away. And we saw that firms in these markets face a perfectly elastic demand curve. And therefore, they're having to price at marginal cost. And in the long run, there are no economic profits, so prices at the minimum of average total cost. But what happens when you have a monopoly, which is the only seller in a market, they now face a different demand curve. They're going to see, we're going to see in this video how price searchers operate in setting their own price and quantity of output. So a monopolist is a single seller in a market. It is the only seller in that market. And we see these in different ways. We'll find out why they persist. And the ultimate mark, uh, monopoly is, of course, marriage, which both partners have forsworn competition, and therefore you're a monopoly provider of relationship services to your partner. Now, just because a company has a large market share does not make it a monopolist. This is a myth. A lot of people will look at something like Walmart and say that it's a monopolist because of its size and its market share. However, it is not a monopolist. Mark, uh, Walmart has operated very efficiently, very competitively, and in doing so, they've satisfied more customers than anyone else, and they've grown that market share due to better, uh, better, you know, more competition and better serving their customers. So that's not a monopolist. So when we look at a monopolist, we see instead of a perfectly elastic demand curve, now a monopolist faces a downward sloping demand curve. They can, they're going to find that if they want to increase output, they have to lower their price. So they want to find the profit maximizing price. In the perfectly competitive market, price is equal to marginal cost. Therefore, this would be the outcome in a perfectly competitive market. The price would be $100, which is the marginal cost of the firm. It would sell 240 units. In the long run, it would price at the minimum of its average total cost, not earning economic profit. So this would be the outcome in a perfectly competitive model. Now, just like the perfectly competitive model, the uh, profit maximizing monopolist sets marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. But given that it faces a downward sloping demand curve, its marginal revenue will always be less than price. And we'll see this, we'll see why in just a minute. But marginal revenue is less than price. It sets its marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and it sets that quantity and it can sell 150 units at $145. And that becomes its profit maximizing level of output and profit maximizing price. Now for the monopolist, this is again $75 above its marginal cost and so it's earning way more than what the perfectly competitive firm would be earning. And this is the economic profit earned by the monopolist in this case here. At 150 units, its average total cost is $105. Therefore, it's earning $40 in economic profit for every unit sold. And in this case here, it's a $6,000 economic profit earned by this firm. Why do we look at these as being inefficient? Well, with a monopolist, because they're restricting output, they're not selling these units between 150 and 240 units that would be deemed economically efficient because people value those units more than what it costs the monopolist to produce those units. If you look at the red circle again, the monopolist has no incentive to go beyond 150 units because the marginal cost of producing an additional unit exceeds the marginal revenue it would get from producing that. However, consumers value those units more than it costs the monopolist to produce and they don't produce them so that red triangle is considered a deadweight loss. It's the lost consumer and producer surplus from not producing the 150 to the 240th units. Now I said that we we're going to see why it is that marginal revenue will always be less than price and let's say you're starting out with monopolist pricing at $145 and selling 150 units and the monopolist wants to lower its price to $100 to, in order to sell more units. Well, in doing so, it's going to sell 90 more units. And that's the additional revenue earned by the, the, the profit maximizing monopolist. In this case here, they're getting the green area as additional revenue. However, in order to sell those additional units, it also had to lower the price on the first 150 units that it was able to sell for 145. It's now selling them for 100. So the price will always be greater than marginal revenue because in order to sell these additional units, the firm will earn additional revenue from additional sales, but it will also lose revenue from having to lower its price on units it could have sold at a higher price. And for this reason, marginal revenue will always be less than price when you have a downward sloping demand curve. In this case here, the total revenue is $21,750. 
by lowering the price to $100, the firms increase the revenue to $24,000. However, the marginal revenue, which is the change in total revenue divided by change in quantity, is equal to $25, which is less than the $100 price the firm is charging. So marginal revenue will always be less than price when you have a downward sloping demand curve simply because a firm has to lower its price on additional on the units it had been selling for a higher price in order to sell the additional units. Now, not all monopolists earn economic profit. This is a myth that people believe that all monopolists are profitable. Here are two examples. There are many others, including uh, mass transit systems around the world. They don't always earn economic profit just because they're a monopolist. So we'll go back and use the exact same model we had been using for the first demonstration of monopoly, and let's just increase the average total cost. What this represents is higher fixed costs for the, this firm relative to uh, the firm that we had been looking at. So here the monopolist is losing money because it's now having to price at $145, which is $40 lower than its average total cost of that 150th unit. So it's suffering this economic loss. It is having to sell units for a lower price than its average total cost. If it tried raising its prices, it would simply lose sales and it would be worse. So this is the best it can do is this economic loss of $6,000. So again, just because a company is a monopolist does not mean it always earns economic profit. So what prevents competition in a monopolistic market? First thing is licensing and regulations. Uh, patents predict, uh, protect companies from the innovations and the discoveries or the products they bring to the market. Uh, copyright will protect Disney from the Mickey Mouse ears being replicated and sold at a cheaper price. I can't compete in the New York taxicab market because I need a medallion. Occupational licensing laws are notorious for precluding market competition. And these are just a few that allow a single seller in the market to operate. You can also look at something like an energy company or a uh, cable TV franchise. I'm not allowed to compete against them and therefore they're able to charge monopoly prices. If you were the sole seller of a natural resource, or you have sole control of a natural resource, you can monopolize a, a goods market. In the case of Alcoa, they were the owners of the only bauxite mines in the country, and therefore bauxite is used in the production of aluminum. They therefore were monopolists because they controlled the bauxite market. Now, you have to remember also, they didn't need to be able to sell aluminum in order to become a monopolist with a bauxite mine. They simply could have allowed, you know, sold their bauxite to a bunch of different aluminum companies and still maximize their monopoly profit. However, Alcoa is notorious as a company that had been charged with antitrust violations uh, given this ownership. And the last is a natural monopoly. And this is a company that has large, large fixed costs and its long run average total costs are decreasing throughout the uh, size of the market and therefore it's cheaper for one company to produce the whole market than it is for two to split it up or more to split it up because the higher fixed costs are going to be spread across fewer and fewer companies in a firm. And so basically it's economies of scale that create natural monopolies. So what's the takeaway from this? Well, first a monopolist is a sole seller in a market. It will, just like a perfectly competitive firm, set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. However, price is greater than marginal revenue, so price will also be greater than marginal cost. And this leads to inefficiencies. Price also may be less than average total cost. Not all monopolists earn economic profit, but price in this market tends not to equal average total cost. And then again, the inefficiencies are given uh, due to the reduced output and the higher prices, as well as the poor quality goods and services that monopolists tend to produce because they don't have people competing against them to better serve their customers. That's all, folks.